Hi everyone, so um, we should get underway for the beginning of uh, the afternoon session today. So our two speakers uh, this afternoon will be Adrian Johnston and Catherine Malibu. Um, and then again, we'll have a round table this evening from 7 to 9 p.m. Um, so it's a, a real pleasure to introduce Adrian Johnston uh, to Mama and Zagra, where he'll be speaking today for the first time. Um, I first met Adrian uh, a couple of years ago now, I suppose, um, at, uh, or so, I suppose just one year ago, at uh, a conference at Cornell. Is that right? Was that just last year? 2010. Yeah, I suppose that's right. And, uh, um, and then had the opportunity to invite him this fall also to UC Davis and uh, spend some time in the Bay Area with him. And uh, uh, our conversations, um, Adrian's work, uh, and also his intellectual generosity um, as a reader of my own work has been really important to uh, the development of, of my thinking over the, last, over the last year in particular, but also before that, uh, reading through uh, his very important books. Um, and so I just wanted to uh, acknowledge, I suppose, uh, you know, the importance of my friendship with Adrian and also the importance of, of his work and his thinking uh, to the projects I'm engaged in. Adrian Johnston is a professor in the Department of Philosophy at the University of New, Mexi New Mexico at Albuquerque and an assistant teaching analyst at the Emory Psychoanalytic Institute in Atlanta. He is the author of Time Driven, Metapsychology and the Splitting of the Drive in 2005 of Zizek's Ontology, A Transcendental Materialist Theory of Subjectivity in 2008, uh, and Badiou, Zizek, and Political Transformations, The Cases of Change in 2009. Uh, all of those published with Northwestern University Press. With Catherine Malibu, our second speaker today, he has co-authored a book on affects uh, entitled Self and Emotional Life, Merging Philosophy, Psychoanalysis, and Neurobiology, which is coming from Columbia. And he's currently at work uh, on a two-volume project addressing forms of materialism, ranging from historical and dialectical materialisms to such recent developments as speculative realism. Uh, so Adrian is a very prolific thinker and writer, um, and the range of the material that he's able to cover and grapple with is always impressive. For me, the primary significance of Johnston's work, which is considerable, I think, uh, is that he is a thinker of the split, or of splitting. Um, of the Spaltam that divides both the drive, the Freudian creed, and that divides the subject in both its Kantian <coughs> and Lacanian versions. What links Johnston's first two books, uh, which I think are required reading for anyone who wants to think through the crucial relation between psychoanalysis and German idealism, is that this thinking of the split drive, in the case of the first book, Time Driven, and of the split subject, in the case of Zizek's ontology, uh, is concomitant with the thinking of time. The important gesture of these two books and the integral coherence of their projects, as I see it, uh, is to precisely delineate and expose the manner in, in which uh, um, the manner in which it is these two splits, both the drive and the subject, um, into two irresolvable axes. Uh, the manner in which, sorry, he elaborates these two splits um, of both the drive and the subject into two irresolvable axes. Um, and the way in which he expounds the manner in which the splitting of the drive of the subject by time is not only the motor of psychic life and the structure of cognition, um, but it also opens up something like a philosophical method. For Johnston, the thinking of psychoanalysis in terms of the temporality of the spaltum and the reading of transcendental idealism as a theory of the split subject allows one to reconsider the manner in which both Freudian metapsychology and Kantian critique can be understood as materialist theories. This is sort of integral operation of these two books, I think, in relation to method. In Zizek's ontology, a transcendental materialist theory of subjectivity, Johnston makes clear how the splitting of the subject itself between noumenal and phenomenal registers, between a phenomenal subject affected by time and a noumenal subject subtracted from time uh, and auto-affection, enables one to rethink the problem of genesis, uh, afflicting transcendental philosophy in a manner which allows us to think the emergence of transcendental conditions of possible experience from the evolution of cognitive capacities in material bodies. These cognitive capacities, however, the emergence of intuition, understanding, imagination, and reason, uh, are never entirely free from the originary trauma 
of their material instantiation in bodies. And psychoanalysis thus becomes the theory of the impasse of thought and feeling and encounter due to the splitting of the subject by time and the splitting of the drive by an irresolvable temporal antagonism. In short, if Adrian's work is uncircumventable for contemporary philosophy, it's because it opens the possibility of a sophisticated materialism and naturalism that has worked through the rigors of transcendental idealism and Freudian metapsychology and is therefore capable of grappling with the challenges that these pose to the coherence of any claim to be able to render thought adequate to being or to matter. Um, so I'm excited to hear more today about the way in which Adrian's work is developing, uh, and please help me in welcoming Adrian Johnson. I would like to begin by thanking Nathan for his kind introduction. Uh, he and I belong to a mutual admiration society, and moreover, uh, I would say that as we did before this past November at UC Davis when Martin Hagland and me were visiting, uh, he, Nathan, is able to summarize my work better than I can myself. In fact, um, I'm hoping to be able to plagiarize the two different versions of introductions that he's done for me already uh, in less than a year. Uh, because, as Heidegger would put it, he is able to think my own thought. Uh, I, in addition, want to thank our kind hosts here, not only Nathan, who has done an enormous amount of work to organize this event to bring us together, but also, of course, Petar, Tomislav, everyone at MAMA, and also the audience. I have enjoyed myself immensely thus far, uh, and I look forward eagerly to the rest of today. So thank you very much. Uh, I uh, uh, echo the sentiments of my fellow speakers who have already voiced their gratitude for all that's been done uh, to make this possible. What I am about to present is an excerpt from a chapter of a book in progress, in fact, the second volume of that two-volume materialism project. And because it's an excerpt, in fact, it's the last third of a chapter, uh, I'm forced to begin in medias res. I don't think that that creates uh, uh, much difficulty in terms of you, the audience, being able to follow uh, the first portion on McDowell. However, what I had to leave out was a rather length, lengthy exegesis of McDowell's epistemology of perceptual experience, which itself is very much indebted to the work of his Pittsburgh predecessor, Wilfred Sellers, about whom uh, Ray Brassier spoke some yesterday. Uh, if it proves to be necessary for me to flesh out that background a bit more, to clarify further uh, what is going on in terms of how McDowell talks about the relations between percepts and concepts in the constitution of experience and the knowledge based upon experience, um, I'm very happy to uh, lay that out in uh, the question and answer session to follow uh, and or during this evening's round table. So with that in mind, I'll uh, get well and truly underway. My depictions of Jacques Lacan's analytic thought in several other contexts can be reinterpreted as suggesting that he attempts in his own fashions to strike balances akin to the balance the Anglo-American analytic neo-Hegelian philosopher John McDowell seeks to achieve in negotiating between the empiricism attacked by Wilfred Sellers in his famous assault on the quote-unquote myth of the given and the coherentism advocated by Donald Davidson for one. Specifically, my reconstructions of Lacanian accounts of both the libidinal economy of drives and desires as per my 2005 book Time Driven as well as affective life, conscious and unconscious, as per my contributions to a forthcoming book co-authored with fellow speaker Kathleen Malibu and entitled Self and Emotional Life. These reconstructions indicate that Lacan simultaneously refuses to treat anything on the order of affect, drive, or desire as a sort of capital G given, qua unmediated, rock bottom, grounding as stabilizing substance or phenomenon, while nonetheless avoiding what he's so often accused of promoting, namely, as McDowell would phrase it, a frictionless socio-symbolic spinning in an entirely anti-natural void. Among a plethora of conceptual theoretical devices, Lacan's tripartite register theory, particularly in terms of the well-known role of the real therein, as this role is elaborated upon over the extended course of his teachings, enables him to bypass the same types of stale, sterile, false dilemmas that McDowell likewise wishes to escape and exorcise. However, 
Drawing out these parallels between Lacan and McDowell in detail is a task I sidestep here and leave for the future. I also set aside another chore made mandatory by any attempt at a rapprochement between Lacan and McDowell. That is, a psychoanalytically informed diagnosis and dismantling of McDowell's unargued for Cartesian Lockean hangover. This is in tension with his invocations of Marx and the notion of ideology to be touched upon shortly. A Cartesian Lockean hangover according to which the mental tends to be conscious. A hangover betrayed by his fretting about the ostensible awkwardness of positing select forms of spontaneity as instances of unconscious freedom, something Lacan especially, with his subject of the unconscious, directly and emphatically affirms. Picking up the thread of what McDowell puts forward as his relaxed platonic quasi-naturalism of second nature, now in relation to the sciences. McDowell challenges the still prevailing default assumption, at least prevalent in lay non-specialist popular consciousness, that any and every naturalism inevitably must accept the authority of the rendition of nature promoted by what he christens quote unquote bald naturalism. That is, nature is nothing more than matter in motion governed by the laws of efficient causes. He begins this challenge thus, quote, it would be a cheat, a merely verbal maneuver, to object that naturalism about nature cannot be open to question. If we can rethink our conception of nature so as to make room for spontaneity, even though we deny that spontaneity is capturable by the resources of bald naturalism, we shall by the same token be rethinking our conception of what it takes for a position to deserve to be called naturalism, end quote. He immediately goes on to say, quote, the rethinking requires a different conception of actualizations of our nature. We need to bring responsiveness to meaning back into the operations of our natural sentient capacities as such, even while we insist that responsiveness to meaning cannot be captured in naturalistic terms, so long as naturalistic is glossed in terms of the realm of law, end quote. He also forcefully and eloquently reiterates these assertions in texts after his magnum opus, Mind and World, maintaining, in an exchange with Hegel scholar Robert Pippin, who will appear momentarily, maintaining that, quote, what is natural need not be equated with what is explicable by the natural sciences, second nature is nature too, end quote, and, quote, there is nothing obligatory about equating nature with the domain of natural scientific intelligibility, end quote. So as to calm and quiet down likely naturalist objectors to his contestation of the traditional hegemony of the nature of bald naturalism, McDowell observes that his vision of a naturalized second nature by no means calls for a total and complete overthrow of the natural sciences. He maintains that nature qua kingdom of causal laws separate from the logical linguistic space of conceptual rationality can and should be retained. He concedes to the bald naturalist that there indeed is a disenchanted realm of meaningless laws as efficient without final causes. But he warns, this realm shouldn't be equated with nature to cool. In an essay addressing Davidson's anomalous monism, McDowell recommends leaving quote unquote objective reality as the target domain of the explanatory strategies of the empirical or experimental sciences of modernity. McDowell recommends leaving objective reality to natural science while simultaneously refusing to abandon the insistence on the natural scientific inexplicability of an autonomous rational subjectivity nevertheless embedded within this same objective reality. For the time being, I want it to be remembered that these qualifications both admit the nature of the natural sciences to be law governed in a very standard modern sense as well as purport second nature strata and subjectivities to be basically refractory to any mode of scientific explanation. McDowell takes it that the first three lectures of Mind and World, that is its first half, succeed in showing at the epistemological level how rendering active conceptual spontaneity exhaustively imminent to passive perceptual receptivity is the only viable route beyond the profoundly unsatisfying oscillation between empiricism and coherentism. If this is so, then, 
with the perceptual as first nature and the conceptual as second nature, this requires, at least in the case of human subjects, a radically transformed philosophical notion of first nature corresponding to how human subjects' first natures are themselves radically transformed by the genesis of second nature. Insofar as this second nature is associated with freedom, the deterministic picture of lawful nature justifiably imputed to what is subsumed under the rubric of bald naturalism simply will not do. In the tenor of his invocations of Marx, McDowell goes so far as to allege that bald naturalism as, quote, a naturalism that constricts the idea of nature, end quote, is backed up not by rigorous philosophical argumentation, but instead by scientific, quote unquote, ideological biases, questionably fetishizing select images of the natural sciences and persisting as widespread articles of faith held to uncritically and with frequency unconsciously by various sides and debates about naturalism. Departing from ontological concerns having to do with philosophical materialism and realism in relation to the sciences, being different from the Kant-inspired post and epistemological considerations apropos perceptual experience primarily motivating the doubt. I have in past publications made similar arguments regarding naturalism. McDowell allows that a focus on perceptual experience need not be the lone entrance into what he presents as his relaxed naturalism. Speaking from a Hegelian Zizekian perspective, I've claimed that naturalizing human beings isn't as per the assumptions of positions resembling bald naturalism. That naturalizing human beings isn't a non-dialectical, one-way street leading to the result of an impoverishing reduction of subjectivity to natural substance as already envisioned in 17th and 18th century science. Rather, not only are certain conceptions of subjectivity dramatically changed in being submitted to naturalization, in a reciprocal dialectical twist, prior conceptions of nature, including modernity's ideas about material substance, must be significantly altered in tandem so as to do justice to the strangeness of the structures and phenomena constitutive of and exhibited by human subjects. On these specific counts, McDowell and I are very much on the same page. But McDowell and I part company precisely along the line of demarcation distinguishing epistemology from ontology. In the fourth lecture of Mind and World, McDowell evinces hesitation around the matter of ontologizing his naturalism of second nature. Faithful to the epistemological motivations driving his reconsideration of perceptual experience in the first three lectures, he cordons off his quasi-naturalism in the indeterminate gray ontological limbo of being a doctrine to be embraced only insofar as his epistemology of experience requires it. This calls to mind the caution of the restrained Kantian as if, so anathema to Hegel. Along related lines, in a treatment of Daniel Dennett elsewhere, McDowell urges that analytic philosophers of mind, usually fixated upon such things as the ontologies at stake in the stubborn mind-body problem, should be aware at the same time of the epistemological presuppositions and ramifications of their proposals. In good Hegelian spirit, I can begin laying out my bones of contention with McDowell through an imminent critical assessment of him. As just remarked, he insists that ontology must be accompanied by epistemology. But, as various moments of his own project exhibit, the inverse is at least equally true. Epistemology must be, nay, cannot avoid being, accompanied by ontology, even when the former tries to refrain from straying onto the terrain of the latter. What's more, the insistence on the unavoidability of ontology for epistemology is at the heart of Hegel's recurrent problemizations of Kant's critical philosophy. McDowell not only is deeply sympathetic to Hegelian philosophy generally, his indictment of Kant for falling into subjective idealism repeats Hegel and thereby signals his approval, which he indeed expresses, of Hegel's absolute idealism with its objective side. McDowell's desire to retain a vivid realist hue in his epistemology, thereby generating the world-gripping quote-unquote external friction missing from anti-empiricist coherentism, 
pushes him away from Kant, regardless of the Kantian inspiration for his perspective on perceptual experience, and into the arms of Hegel. But, minus an ontologization of his quasi-naturalism, McDowell is in danger of sliding back into the idealist subjectivism he discerns and dismisses in Kant's transcendental idealism. Similarly, McDowell's disputes with Pippin, particularly as revolving around the related themes of the natural and the social, indirectly suggests that, by his own lights, he cannot refrain from, in some sense, ontologizing his modified naturalism, of ascribing real being to the second natures of subjectivities. Whereas Pippin has come to share Robert Brandom's tendencies lopsidedly to depict Hegel as a social rationality pragmatist avant la lettre with pronounced anti-realist leanings, McDowell cast doubts on Pippin's overriding emphases on sociality alone in Hegelian thought, specifically in terms of the functions of recognition therein. He cast these doubts in conjunction with stressing the non-coherentist, non-inferentialist realism entailed by the objective side of Hegel's idealism. Pippin responds by drawing attention to McDowell's vacillations between epistemology and ontology, apropos as naturalism, as I did a short while ago, and recommends restricting this naturalism to, at most, a modest, post-Kantian, deontologized epistemological framework outlining praxis-level conditions of discursive explanatory adequacy. In response to McDowell's vacillations here, I want to push him in the opposite direction. That is, towards going all the way to the end with an immodestly ambitious post-Hegelian realism generated precisely through the gesture of ontologizing his relaxed platonic naturalism of second nature. Richard Bernstein approvingly contrasts McDowell's quote-unquote domesticated Hegelianism with wild versions Whereas I am committed to a view of Hegel according to which Bernstein's phrase for McDowell's version is oxymoronic, and the only true version of Hegelianism proper would be a wild one. This nudge is delivered in the form of an imminent critique, because I believe this gesture to be a consequent extension of McDowell's project, despite his reservations about pursuing this course himself. The number and extent of their disagreements notwithstanding, McDowell and Pippin, along with legions of continentalists past and present, nonetheless share a dubitable assumption lurking in the recesses of their conversations, an assumption according to which a theoretical naturalism informed by the natural sciences, however qualified and nuanced this naturalism might be, inevitably and necessarily is quote-unquote bald, or at a minimum severely thinning, that is mechanistic, reductive, eliminative, etc. This assumption is based on outdated, obsolete, and grossly distorted pictures of the natural sciences, particularly the life sciences as they stand today. Neither Newtonianism nor the Churchlands accurately reflect the spontaneous philosophical naturalisms accompanying, even sometimes without the explicit awareness of the scientists themselves, accompanying contemporary advances in fields such as the neurosciences, genetics, and evolutionary theory. I can sum up this line of counter-argumentation contra both McDowell and Pippin, and numerous others to boot, by declaring that a contemporary naturalism nourished by a range of recent scientific discoveries is bald only in the same sense as Bertrand Russell's present King of France. Glancing at Pippin for a moment, with the proceeding in view, he conjectures that many of McDowell's proponents of bald naturalism would be willing and able to accept the McDowellian vision of second nature as bound up with socio-symbolic bildung. Quote, it is not hard to imagine all sorts of bald naturalists nodding in agreement, convinced that the training up of neural nets can handle second nature considerations just fine, end quote. In short, Pippin denies the supposed incompatibility between bald and relaxed naturalisms relied upon in the second half of mind and world. A few pages later in the same essay, he observes, quote, given the unbelievable variety in human culture, it seems safe to say that first nature radically underdetermines, even while it conditions any second nature, end quote. In intervening into the ongoing mcdowell pippin debates about naturalism, the move I recommend making is fundamentally quite simple, hopefully in a manner of elegant simplicity a move philosophically interpreting an array of natural scientific findings as demonstrated 
on empirical and experimental grounds that the real material being of human beings, their first nature in the Italian parlance, really is in and of itself quote unquote radically underdetermined as Pippin himself puts it without intending for his words to be ontologized as part of a philosophy of nature. Strikingly, in addition to growing bodies of scientific and philosophical literature supporting this move of mind, Francisco Varela and his collaborators speak of literal quote unquote underdetermination in elaborating a biologically based and phenomenologically informed version of cognitive science. Instead of adding something to first nature, McDowell's ubiquitous use of the phrase second nature implies the addition of something more, second, to something else coming before it, logically and or chronologically. Instead of adding something to first nature, the subjective spontaneity McDowell wishes to defend without lapsing into the quote-unquote supernaturalism of a quote-unquote rampant Platonism could be theorized on the basis of subtracting something from first nature. What I propose subtracting is nothing other than what McDowell, as highlighted earlier, retains with his post salarsian and non-dialectical distinction between the realm of causal laws, that is first nature, and the logical space of reasons, that is second nature. Namely, he retains the picture of a first nature as a totalitarian regime of ironclad, unbreakable laws of efficient causality investigated by the natural sciences. A portrait of nature, philosopher of science, Nancy Cartwright's landscape of a quote-unquote dappled world contests at its deepest roots, even down to the foundational scientific discipline of mathematized physics. Many of the lengths to which McDowell must go in clarifying his naturalism of second nature perhaps are unnecessary. That is, branches of speculation that can be pruned by an Occam's razor wielded by the alternate approach I'm pleading for here. Moreover, Hegel's neglected remarks about the quote-unquote weakness or quote-unquote impotence Ohnmacht, of nature in his generally neglected philosophy of nature as well as wildly popular philosophy of history, a weakness or impotence attributed to real nature itself as part of the objective realism of absolute idealism, distinguish him as the key ancestor at a minimum in the guise of a Brandonian de Re interpretation if not de dicto, this distinguishes him as the key ancestor of a speculative motif subsequently taken up and fortified by Freudian Lacanian psychoanalysis and cutting edge neurobiology, a la, for example, David J. Linden and Gary Marcus on the human central nervous system as a quote unquote kludge. Continuing in the mode of an imminent critique, McDowell's Wittgensteinian therapeutic sensibilities and methods can be turned against him in this setting. Recall that McDowell, in the first half of Mind and World, formulates his epistemology of perceptual experience motivated by the desire to soothe away the quote-unquote philosophical discomfort provoked by what he identifies as the false either-or choice between naive realist empiricism and anti-realist coherentism. Since the rest of his project, including his naturalism, follows from and is justified by this, it plausibly can be asserted that McDowell, perhaps like all thinkers, decides upon zero-level foundational axioms and intuitions through considerations weighing degrees of discomfort, as dissatisfaction, puzzlement, uneasiness, and the like. Consequently, in terms of McDowellian methodology, if a philosophical move arouses more intellectual agitation than it settles, all other things being equal, it shouldn't be made. At least for me, with my own sensibilities, putting forward second nature as a scientifically inexplicable and sui generis phenomenon of indeterminate ontological status is a maneuver leaving me with the unsettling feeling that it provokes more discomfort than it ameliorates, although this may simply reflect the fact that McDowell and I have very different baseline philosophical temperaments. Here I agree with a pro-Hegelian, anti-dualist, quote-unquote, slogan voiced by Brandon. Quote, a dualism is a distinction drawn in such a way as to render unintelligible crucial relations between the distinguished items, end quote. Due to the unintelligibility of the relations between first and second natures in McDowell's thought, he's in danger of seeming to be anti-Hegelian and pro-dualist, namely, 
supernaturalist in the very sense he struggles to fend off. I also concur with Brandom when he objects to McDowell's tendency to fall back on the Wittgensteinian therapeutic dimension of his endeavors as a tactic of shirking responsibility for answering questions arising from a number of quote-unquote hard problems surrounding his project, to use David Chalmers' phrase, coined for the perennial mind-body issue. This tendency is particularly inadmissible for a Hegelian absolute idealist with an acute awareness, at least on other occasions, of the ineliminable entanglements of epistemological and ontological dimensions in philosophy. As a Hegelian Lacanian with a soft spot for the hard sciences, I am much less discomforted by hypothesizing that denaturalized subjectivities can and do arise in explicable fashions from the brains, bodies, and environments, both natural and non-natural, studied by, among other disciplines, the life sciences. As Stephen Hulgate indicates, by trying to draw the attention of McDowell and McDowell's readers to Hegel's philosophy of subjective spirit, following on the heels of the philosophy of nature in the philosophy of spirit, Hegel strives mightily to demystify the emergence of second out of first nature, of spirit qua subjectivity out of nature qua substance. Hegel is content neither to leave Geistiger subjects ontologically fuzzy, mired in the murkiness of the Kantian critical as if he repeatedly attacks as philosophically untenable, nor to claim dogmatically that such subjects are in principle sui generis and forever inexplicable vis-a-vis -vis natural materialities. On the more scientific, as distinct from the Hegelian side, I adhere to what strikes me as the reasonable starting assumption that the physical constitution of human anatomy furnishes necessary and sometimes, in certain instances of particular function, sufficient conditions for the effective existence of the sorts of subjects McDowell philosophizes about under the heading of second nature. In the form of a slogan, no first nature brain, no second nature subject, which doesn't assert either if first nature brain alone, then second nature subject, or second nature subject equals first nature brain. In the sixth and final lecture of Mind and World, McDowell maintains that there is no need for scientific accounts of second nature. I would add to this nothing more than a small qualification. Unless one wants to shut down, to seal up for good, the possibility of any resurfacing of supernatural appearances, with a concerned Hegelian wide eye to philosophy and science as quote unquote moments of larger complex structures including social, cultural, political, and religious moments, too. To head off a likely misunderstanding at this point, I am not flatly advocating a reduction or elimination of McDowellian second nature subjectivity. Instead, substituting my subtractive gesture of decompleting first nature for McDowell's additive one of completing it with second nature, he and his followers would say, quote unquote, re-enchanting it, as McDowell fears, re-enchantment still sounds to my ears eerily like repackaged supernaturalism. This lets me affirm with McDowell the effective existence of autonomous subjects 